In 1836, several months after his baptism, Lorenzo Snow received his patriarchal blessing. The blessing, given under the hands of Joseph Smith Sr., was nothing short of remarkable. Thou hast a great work to perform in thy day and generation. God has called thee to the ministry. Thou shalt have faith even like that of the brother of Jared. There shall not be a mightier man on earth than thou. The diseased shall send to thee their aprons and handkerchiefs, and by thy touch their owners shall be made whole. Thou shalt have power over unclean spirits. At thy command the powers of darkness shall stand back, and devils shall flee away. If expedient, dead shall rise and come forth at thy bidding. There is no earthly way that Father Smith could have known that this young man, just 22 years of age, would achieve such greatness in his future days. Yet his prophetic words were fulfilled in the magnificent life of Lorenzo Snow. Eliza R. Snow, Lorenzo's older sister, wrote concerning their ancestry. The Snow family were descendants of genuine Puritan stock who fled from religious persecution in the Old World and landed on Plymouth Rock of historic celebrity. The first immigrant ancestor was Richard Snow, who arrived in the New World less than 20 years after the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock and for many years hence. The Snow family would flourish in New England until the first decade of the 19th century when Oliver Snow III and his wife Rosetta, along with their two young daughters, departed for the western frontier. Settling in Manaway, Ohio, a town of just 10 other families, Oliver and Rosetta did their part to increase the local populace. They had two more darling daughters and followed them with three healthy sons. The oldest son, Lorenzo, was born in the humble surroundings of a frontier cabin on April 3, 1814. Lorenzo Snow was raised in a home in which uh, he was taught obedience and also was taught the basic tenets of prayer and belief in God, of course. And there's one story in particular that I think illustrates that Oliver Snow had asked his son, Lorenzo, to go out into the pasture and see if it was dry enough to be plowed. And so he went out to the pasture and was feeling the dirt and looked up just in time to see a very large bull headed toward him. And of course, this scared him to death and he took off and went up a tree. And the bull stayed below the tree and Lorenzo could see he wasn't going to get down very easily. And it was a very cold time of year and his hands began to get numb and he was chilly. So he prayed and he asked his father in heaven to send his father to come find him. And sure enough, it wasn't long before his father came and was able to get him down. And I'm sure that experience for a young boy was very impressive to realize that, that Heavenly Father knew him, knew where he was, and knew his circumstances. Oliver Snow, like most in the area, 
made his living as a farmer. And as was customary for the time, much of Oliver's labor on the farm was provided by his children. Young Lorenzo learned the value of hard work as he toiled from a very young age on his father's farm. As the years passed and Oliver became more involved in public affairs that took him away from home, Lorenzo bore much of the responsibility for the family farm. During the winter months, when work on the farm was minimal, Lorenzo and his siblings attended school. Young Lorenzo loved to read. His older sister Eliza recalled Lorenzo's fascination with learning. Ever a student at home as well as in school, his book was his constant companion when disengaged from filial duties, and when sought by his associates, hit up with his book became proverbial. Young Lorenzo often studied many good books, including the Bible, which was read regularly in the Snow household. Lorenzo Snow was very lucky as a young boy to grow up with such an open, wonderful, warm, tolerant family. They were Baptists, but they were not the type that were so narrow-minded that they couldn't see good in anyone else's life. They had a different way of looking at God or the scriptures. He, certainly, he grew up with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, praying. He knew the stories of the Old and New Testament. But the family was so open, they taught him to look for good in all people, no matter what religious persuasion they had. And as a result, Lorenzo Snow had this attribute his entire life. He could look beyond the confines of a certain point of view and see good in all people. In his teenage years, Lorenzo became enamored with military pursuits. As he labored on the farm, he would dream of leading a uniformed and disciplined regiment of soldiers. When he joined the local militia, Lorenzo's intelligence and leadership skills were soon recognized, and he was given a lieutenant's commission from the governor of Ohio. Lorenzo always wanted to be in the military, and so when he joined, he had his sister make him a military uniform. Now, the thing that intrigued Lorenzo about the military was not just the opportunity to direct men in battle, but he loved the uniform. He loved the gold epaulets, and so he had Eliza make him a uniform. Now, the whole time she's making it, he's so excited that he's going to get to wear this uniform, and she's so nervous that he will eventually have to go to war or be involved in some kind of a skirmish, and so there was that tension between the two. I'm sure Lorenzo's early dreams of being a soldier is very directly related to his grandfather Snow. His grandfather Snow served in the Revolutionary War, and Lorenzo sat at his knee many times and heard all kinds of dramatic, dangerous stories. And he grew up thinking that would be pretty exciting. And it's interesting now as we look back on his life and see, he didn't necessarily become the soldier that he dreamed of early on, but he certainly became a member of the Lord's Army. And he didn't have guns and swords, but he had scriptures and he had truth. And he, his victories were seeing people uh, come to Christ and accept the gospel and be baptized and find true happiness in their lives. In 1831, members of the recently organized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints followed their young prophet, Joseph Smith, to Northern Ohio, where they began settling in the town of Kirtland. Kirtland was not far from Mantaway and the Snow family farm. Before long, Lorenzo and his family came in contact with a missionary spreading abroad their beliefs. At one point, the Snows even traveled to nearby Hiram, Ohio, to hear 25-year-old Joseph Smith address a congregation of nearly 200 local residents. Lorenzo, just 17 at the time, later wrote of his first impressions of the prophet Joseph. He simply bore his testimony to what the Lord had manifested to him to the dispensation of the gospel which had been committed to him, and to the authority that he possessed. As I looked upon him and listened, I thought to myself that a man bearing such a wonderful testimony as he did could hardly be a false prophet. However, being busy in other directions, it passed measurably out of my mind until later. At age 21, Lorenzo determined that to achieve his desired position in the military, a college education would be necessary. Disposing of his paternal inheritance, Lorenzo enrolled at the Oberlin Collegiate Institute, located 50 miles west of Mantaway.
As he traveled from his hometown to the college, he happened upon David W. Patton, who had been ordained as a member of the Twelve Apostles just seven months earlier. Traveling the Ohio countryside together, Elder Patton and Lorenzo discussed the Mormon faith. Lorenzo Snow, one day on his way to uh, Oberlin College, fell in company with David Patton, who had just recently been called to the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He began to teach Lorenzo Snow about the ancient prophets, quoting scriptures. He also talked about God and God's relationship to man. Lorenzo Snow later testified he'd never been in the company of such a religious, wonderful man and how inspired and impressed he was which again began to convert a conversion process in Lorenzo Snow that eventually brought him into the church. Parting ways with Elder Patton, Lorenzo arrived at Oberlin College and entered upon his educational endeavors. He soon discovered, however, that his secular education would be mingled with religious doctrine, as the Oberlin School was sponsored by the Presbyterian Church. Inspired by the unique conversation with Elder Patton, Lorenzo determined to focus his studies for the term upon spiritual and religious enlightenment. Unfortunately, Lorenzo was unable to find cohesiveness between the feelings of his heart and the religious philosophy professed by his instructors and espoused by his fellow students. In a letter to his sister Eliza, who had recently joined the Mormon faith and moved to Kirtland, Lorenzo wrote of his frustrations. If there is nothing better than is to be found here in Oberlin College, goodbye to all religions. Filled with the missionary zeal of a new convert, Eliza wrote to Lorenzo and invited him to come to Kirtland and participate in the School of the Prophets, where Joshua Sexus, a Jewish scholar, would soon be teaching Hebrew. Frustrated with his situation at Oberlin, Lorenzo accepted his sister's invitation and after finishing his term at the college, traveled to Kirtland, Ohio, the center point of the bustling Mormon faith. Lorenzo Snow arrived in Kirtland in early summer of 1836 and this was such an important point in the history of the church. They had, as a people, just dedicated the Kirtland Temple, and all of the accounts of that experience were Pentecostal in nature. And in this same Kirtland Temple, they were holding the School of the Prophets, where Joseph was preparing the missionaries, essentially, to go out into the world. And so they were studying um, church doctrine. But in addition, they were studying languages. They studied Hebrew. They studied German. They even studied geography. And these were people who weren't necessarily schooled. Now, Lorenzo was an exception to that. He had a great grasp of the academic life and liked it. But he had chosen to try out this school of the prophets that Eliza had encouraged him to attend. And what he found was this constant involvement in feelings of the spirit and the study of doctrine. And he was so caught up in it. And I think at that point, he dismissed any ideas of going on in any other pursuit with his life. He really essentially threw himself in to the work of the kingdom of God. Several weeks after settling in Kirtland, Lorenzo became convinced that the spiritual outpourings in this unique community were truly from God. And in June of 1836, he proved his faith further when he entered the Chagrin River and was baptized by John F. Boynton. Lorenzo rejoiced to be a part of the Latter-day Saints, but couldn't help feeling that his conversion lacked a confirmation from the Lord. Shortly after his baptism, Lorenzo pondered this lack of affirmation and determined to do as the prophet Joseph had done. He retired to a secluded spot in the neighboring woods and called upon God for a witness. I had no sooner opened my lips than I heard a sound just above my head, like the rustling of silken robes. And immediately the Spirit of God descended upon me, completely enveloping my whole person. Oh, the joy and happiness I felt. 
No language can describe the almost instantaneous transition from a dense cloud of mental and spiritual darkness into refulgence of light and knowledge that God lives. It was a complete baptism and even more real and physical in its effects upon my system than the immersion by water. Determined now that he had truly found the kingdom of the Lord, Lorenzo turned his attention to learning how he could best serve in this latter-day work. He received his patriarchal blessing under the hand of Joseph Smith, Sr., and was given those tremendous blessings and promises that would mark this future prophet of God. Early in 1837, Lorenzo was ordained an elder, and in fulfillment of his sacred patriarchal blessing, he set out on his first mission that very spring. Lorenzo departed on foot, armed only with his testimony of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Walking through much of Ohio and the territory he knew so well from the days of his youth, Lorenzo had no difficulty bearing his testimony. But he did, however, struggle with the idea of traveling without purse or script. From the time I was old enough to work, the feeling that I paid my way always seemed a necessary adjunct to self-respect and nothing but a positive knowledge that God required it now, as he did anciently of his servants, the disciples of Jesus, could induce me to go forth dependent on my fellow creatures. Lorenzo was naturally uncomfortable asking strangers for food and, and lodging, but he was anxious to uh, fulfill the Lord's commission for him to travel as the apostles did of old without purse or script. Uh, often he and the others would go without food and have to sleep outside because they were turned away. But on one particular occasion, as they were being turned away by the innkeeper, Lorenzo reminded the innkeeper that he and his companion were disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ and that they needed to be fed and they needed lodging. And then he quoted that scripture from Matthew where the Savior said, if you do it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. And the innkeeper quickly changed his mind, provided them with a great meal, a nice room, and in the morning sent them away with a hearty breakfast. Working his way around Ohio, Lorenzo met with much success. He even baptized several schoolmates and relatives in Medina County, including one Mary Adeline Goddard, who eight years later would become his wife. As a missionary, Elder Snow was ever aware of the promptings of the Spirit. One night, he had a vivid dream that a group of men was organizing a mob to attack him. The very next day, he was approached by two seemingly respectable gentlemen asking him to preach at a nearby schoolhouse. The dream of the night before came to mind, and he humbly declined their invitation, despite their many pleadings. Later, he would learn that if he had not listened to the Spirit and had gone to the school, he would have discovered an angry mob lying in wait for him. In the fall of 1837, Lorenzo returned triumphantly to Kirtland, having shared the gospel faithfully throughout his home state. And his sacrifice and service in the mission field had strengthened his young testimony and prepared him to face the difficulties that lay ahead. During Elder Snow's absence, the entire demeanor of the city he left behind had changed. In 1837, apostasy had swept through Kirtland like a plague. Financial troubles involving the failure of the Bank of Kirtland led to widespread anger and frustration among the saints, much of which was directed at the Prophet Joseph and Sidney Rigdon. Five members of the Twelve Apostles turned against the Prophet and rallied other church members to do the same. Lorenzo Snow was able to weather the apostasy in Kirtland because his testimony was very much his own. He hadn't borrowed it from anybody else. Now, by that time, all of his family were living with the church in Kirtland, and that was a help to him. But the things that really solidified his faith solidified it so much that not even a few of the former members of the Twelve could turn him against Joseph Smith and the restored gospel were the personal witness he had received after his baptism and the many experiences he had while he was on his mission. 
By January of 1838, the Prophet Joseph and Brother Rigdon no longer felt safe in Kirtland, and they departed to join with saints in far west Missouri on the western frontier. Remaining faithful to the Prophet, Lorenzo and the Snow family packed what they could into wagons and left Kirtland just three months later. Lorenzo drove one of the wagons on the westward march until they reached a point about 100 miles from far west when he contracted bilious fever. Eliza R. Snow recorded, He suffered such a racking pain in his head that when we traveled, I held his head as steady as possible to prevent excruciating suffering being produced by the motion of the wagon. Arriving in far west, Lorenzo and Eliza were invited to stay in the home of Sidney Rigdon while Lorenzo recovered. The rest of the Snow family continued 30 miles to Adamondayaman, where they had chosen to settle. After two weeks, Lorenzo's strength was sufficient to allow him and Eliza to catch up with the family. Though still weak from the illness, Lorenzo did what he could to help his father and brothers in building up a new family farm at Adamondayaman. During this recuperation period, Lorenzo spent much of his time studying the scriptures and refining his knowledge of the restored gospel. Yet on occasion, he craved the favorite outdoor recreation of his youth, hunting. There was a very decisive moment in Lorenzo Snow's life when the saints were in Adam on Down and he was recovering and in the Snow home there, uh, decided that he wanted to get some fresh air. Now he had been fascinated by the military and like many young boys still to this day, and he became a sports huntsman. So he decided as he was recovering from this illness that he would go out and do a little hunting. As he took his gun and wandered, it had never crossed his mind that maybe this wasn't what God wanted him to do. And he realized that finding enjoyment in simply killing something because it was alive, he really decided that maybe that's wrong. And as this impression came upon him, he really did believe that this was not how God intended us to interact with creation. And he put the gun over his shoulder and walked back to the cabin and made a decision. He just wasn't going to do that anymore. And this profoundly affected him the rest of his life. By late fall, Lorenzo could no longer contain his desire to spread the gospel again. Despite his family's fear that he was not fully recovered from his fever, Elder Snow joined Abel Butterfield and the two left Adam on Diamond once again on foot. The missionaries made their way east across Missouri, preaching where they could. Because of the anti-Mormon sentiment, however, they were unable to tell the people that they were Mormon elders. Reaching the Mississippi, the missionaries decided to split up. Elder Butterfield headed into northern Illinois, while Lorenzo ventured into southern Illinois and northern Kentucky. Elder Snow found most of the people in Kentucky more hospitable and was again able to identify himself as a Mormon elder. Only in a few rare instances did this cause him any problems. In the winter of 1838, Lorenzo was in Kentucky and he was preaching to people. He had a small congregation who had come to hear his message. But outside, there was a mob gathering who were angry about uh, what he was teaching and who wanted to essentially do him in. And they gathered outside and were waiting for him. Well, when he concluded his message, he stepped back towards the fireplace. And one of the members of the mob had infiltrated the crowd and, I guess, brushed his pocket in such a way that he was startled by it and thinking that Lorenzo Snow was armed. This man went outside and dismissed the mob. Well, it turns out that Lorenzo was not armed at all with any kind of a, a gun or, you know, a firearm. He had in his pocket a copy of the scriptures that the Prophet Joseph Smith had given him. And though it was a hard and sturdy little book, it had given the impression to this man um, that it was something else, uh, but it had certainly done its work and saved perhaps Lorenzo Snow's life. In February of 1839, Lorenzo learned by letter from Eliza of the horrible persecution and expulsion of the Missouri Saints, including his own family. The Snows were now living in a town called La Harpe in southwestern Illinois. Frustrated but unable to help at this point, Lorenzo determined to travel to Ohio and continue his efforts there. 
he traveled over 500 miles, often through snow, mud, and rain. Arriving in Ohio at the home of a convert family from his first mission, Lorenzo was so tattered looking that the family did not at first recognize him. After realizing it was their friend, Elder Snow, they quickly took him in and helped him overcome a fever, which no doubt resulted from the arduous journey. During the spring and summer of 1839, Lorenzo preached throughout the northern Ohio area. In the fall, he took a job in Shalersville as a school teacher to generate some much needed money. And although the position was temporary, Lorenzo still took his task to heart. I labored day and night to accomplish my purpose, to elevate my students to a higher standard of intellectual improvement. And at the end of my first year, my school had attained to such a celebrity that it was everywhere spoken of for its wonderful progress. In the spring of 1840, Lorenzo made his way west to gather once again with the body of the saints and his family in Illinois. However, the returned missionary was with his family and friends less than three weeks before he was again summoned into the Lord's vineyard, this time being called to join the great work already underway in England. Before departing, Lorenzo was blessed with an amazing spiritual manifestation that has become an integral principle in Mormon doctrine. Lorenzo Snow listened to a sermon of Brother Sherwood, and he says that his mind was opened and that he saw as clear as day the pathway of God and the pathway of man. And he formed in his mind a couplet which described very simply that vision. The couplet is one that's often used by members of the church today, and it was, as man now is, God once was, and as God now is, man may become. At first, Lorenzo kept this powerful experience in couplet to himself. He told only his sister Eliza, and then later on, after he got to England on his first foreign mission, he told Brigham Young. But at that point, Brigham Young advised him to keep the new doctrine to himself. He said, if true, it has been revealed to you for your own private information, and will be taught in due time by the prophet of the church. Till then, I advise you to lay it upon a shelf and say no more about it. So it was three years later, after returning from his mission, that Lorenzo met with the prophet Joseph Smith, who told Lorenzo that the couplet was, in fact, true gospel doctrine and a revelation from God. Now, Joseph Smith had already suggested this doctrine, and in 1844, he incorporated it into his famous sermon given at the funeral of a faithful member of the church named King Follett. As the summer of 1840 began, Lorenzo departed for Great Britain, leaving behind the impoverished yet budding community of Commerce, Illinois. He made his way east via canal boats to New York City, where he boarded a passenger vessel bound for Liverpool. Never having sailed before, Elder Snow found himself seasick for nearly all of the 42-day journey. His ship encountered three severe storms as it crossed the vast Atlantic Ocean. Arriving in the bustling port city of Liverpool, Lorenzo was pleasantly surprised to find there a branch of nearly 100 newly converted British saints. Staying in Liverpool little more than a week, Elder Snow traveled by rail to Manchester, where he met with members of the Twelve and was assigned to serve in the industrial city of Birmingham. In this town of over 200,000 souls, Lorenzo found a branch of just 16 members, with another branch in nearby Greets Green numbering about 40. Before leaving the area in May of 1841, Lorenzo was able to baptize 18 converts and establish a new branch of the church in Wolverhampton. At a missionary conference in London, Elder Heber C. Kimball of the Twelve acknowledged Lorenzo's tremendous efforts in Birmingham by calling him to preside over the work in London. As Lorenzo settled into his apartment, it was apparent that he was going to have some problems. Uh, it appeared that the adversary knew that he would uh, do a great work in London, and uh, the adversary was prepared to stop that work. Lorenzo Snow awoke one night to see that the room was in chaos. Furniture was moving around. There were objects literally flying through the air. He 
experienced this a number of times over a period of nights, and he thought that the problem would simply go away, but the problem did not go away. So Elder Snow prepared himself uh, by fasting, by prayer, by reading the scriptures, and he used his priesthood to command these evil spirits to leave him, to leave the room, and it was done, and he was able to settle back into his work. His patriarchal blessing said something about a directive that he would uh, command the night and the evil to leave him. That certainly was accomplished, that part of his patriarchal blessing. Lorenzo found the work in London slow and difficult, but he was determined to change that. Under his energetic guidance, the missionaries and members in the area more than doubled their numbers within just six months. Elder Snow also published a pamphlet titled The Only Way to Be Saved and had 5,000 copies printed. Both elders and members were able to use the pamphlet to share the gospel. One of the most memorable experiences Elder Snow had in London was that of presenting specially bound copies of the Book of Mormon to Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. On the heels of his success in London, Lorenzo was called as a counselor to Thomas Ward, the president of the British Mission. In this capacity, Elder Snow traveled throughout England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, teaching and training the other missionaries. In January of 1843, Lorenzo was released as a missionary and was subsequently called to lead a group of 250 British saints to Nauvoo. They departed Liverpool on the Swanton, a ship chartered by Brigham Young and bound for New Orleans. As was the custom, they boarded a ship in England, about 200 Latter-day Saints. The captain was a gregarious, very nice guy, and he accommodated the saints. But there was one young uh, shipmate who just everybody fell in love with. And during the ocean crossing, he became quite ill. And word kind of spread through the ship that he was on his last leg. There was a Sister Martin aboard the ship who was accompanying the saints to Nauvoo, a convert. And she implored the captain to allow Lorenzo Snow to come and give him a blessing. The captain, who was a nice guy, but just felt like it's too late, there's nothing can happen, and uh, kind of rebuffed her, but she was persistent. So Lorenzo Snow was invited to come to the cabin. The captain said, this isn't going to help, he's on his last breath. But Lorenzo Snow approached, prayed, and then laid hands and commanded that the young man be healed. And within a short time, he was on, on deck, praising the Lord. And when they arrived in New Orleans, as a result, uh, many of the crew were baptized. Arriving in Nauvoo, Lorenzo found an entirely different city than the one he had left behind three years ago. The swamps and shabby cabins of commerce were gone, replaced by Nauvoo the Beautiful. Hundreds of new homes, shops, and businesses now covered the land. And atop the nearby hillside, the glorious Nauvoo Temple was being constructed. Lorenzo rejoiced to again be with his best friend and sister Eliza. But he noticed right away that something was making her uncomfortable around him. He worried about his sister until he was one day pulled aside by the prophet Joseph. As they sat alone on the banks of the Mississippi, the prophet revealed to Lorenzo the doctrine of celestial plural marriage and that Eliza had been sealed to him as a plural wife. Now that Eliza no longer held any secrets from Lorenzo, their dear friendship was again restored. However, Lorenzo remained uncomfortable with the doctrine of plural marriage for some time. Shortly after his return to Nauvoo, Lorenzo was commissioned by the prophet as a captain in the Nauvoo Legion. Personally selecting and training the men of his company, Lorenzo no doubt recalled the military aspirations of his youth. By the end of 1843, persecution of the saints again began to rage. New apostates joined forces with the still disgruntled Missourians to stir up animosity in and around Nauvoo. In February of 1844, 
Joseph Smith was meeting with a whole group of uh, men, some of them apostles, some of them just trusted advisors, those people that had been faithful through a difficult period in Nauvoo because for several years they had been under attack and it was very clear to Joseph they couldn't stay there. And so he gathered this group together, Lorenzo Snow being a part of it, and began to organize a scouting party to go out to the west. They were looking at California and Oregon and as they were thinking of doing this, Joseph made the decision that he was going to run for President of the United States. So rather than sending this advance party, many of the apostles left Nauvoo and went off to begin a campaign for Joseph Smith as President of the United States. Under the direction of the Twelve Apostles, brethren were sent through the country in campaigning on behalf of the Prophet, and Elder Snow was directed to do so in his native Ohio. As spring turned to summer, Lorenzo campaigned heartily until he one day stumbled across a mass alignment in Cincinnati. Elder Lyman, a member of the Twelve Apostles, bore the tragic news that Joseph Smith the prophet and his brother Hiram had been killed at the Carthage jail. Elder Snow wrote of his sorrow and loss. The news of this sad event, of course, came wholly unexpected and struck me with profound astonishment and grief, which no language can portray. Suppressing his personal melancholy, Elder Snow made a quick retreat to Nauvoo that he might comfort his sister Eliza, knowing that she would find the martyrdom hard to bear. To Lorenzo's surprise, however, Nauvoo was in a much different state than he had expected. The saints, while grieved at the loss of their prophet, remained faithful and hopeful. They were united behind Brigham Young and the other apostles, who had them working furiously on two important tasks, finishing the temple and preparing to move westward. As the winter of 1845-46 drew closer, the Nauvoo Temple was completed to such an extent that ordinances were begun. Having reached his 31st year, Lorenzo determined that the time of his bachelorhood should come to a close. His sister Eliza recorded the results. When convinced of the duty of marriage, he entered into it on an enlarged scale by having two wives sealed to him for time and eternity at the same time. And not long after, another was added to the number and then another. Thus, all at once, as it were, from the lone bachelor, he was transformed into a husband invested with many domestic responsibilities. Mary Adeline Goddard, Charlotte Squires, Sarah Ann Pritchard, and Harriet Amelia Squires were sealed in the Nauvoo Temple to the future prophet of God, Elder Snow. And with Mary's three children from a previous marriage, their family was already underway. However, after they had only been together several months, the young Snow family was soon called upon, along with the body of the saints, to leave their Nauvoo home. Increased persecution and threats of government invasion forced President Young to begin the evacuation of Nauvoo earlier than planned. The spring departure was rushed, and the saints began crossing the Mississippi in early February 1846. Lorenzo and his family loaded a tent and what other provisions they could into two covered wagons. Pulling the family cow behind them, the snows traveled across the river and camped with the saints at Sugar Creek. There, Brigham Young called Lorenzo to serve as a captain over ten families, including the families of Parley P. and Orson Pratt. Traveling over frozen and snow-covered ground, the suffering saints made their way west. By mid-April, after having traveled nearly 145 miles, the saints stopped to establish a way station for future travelers. Lorenzo and his family, however, continued on with the body of the pioneers to a spot named Mount Pisgah. Here again, a way station of sorts was laid out. During the journey to Mount Pisgah, Lorenzo had been taken ill with a fever so strong that he was delirious. He wrote of his treatment upon arrival at the camp. Elder Phineas Richards, assisted by other kind brethren, took me from my bed, wrapped in a sheet, placed me in a carriage, and drove to a stream of water, and baptized me in the name of the Lord for my recovery. 
the fever immediately abated, and I was delivered from suffering and returned to health. Upon recovery, Elder Snow was called as a leader in Mount Pisgah, and eventually as the presiding officer. Serving in this capacity, Lorenzo and his family remained in this frontier outpost for nearly two years. While here, Adeline, Charlotte, and Sarah Ann would give birth to three darling baby girls, Rosetta, Leonora, and Eliza, named for Lorenzo's mother and sisters. Their joy as a family, however, was darkened when Charlotte's baby, Leonora, passed away shortly after birth. Elder Snow worked hard to keep Mount Pisgah orderly and upbeat, despite the sickness that was rampant in the area. Using committees, he made certain that the pioneering companies were well treated and supplied as they passed through on their way to Council Bluffs. In the spring of 1848, Lorenzo and his family were finally called by Brigham Young to travel on to the Salt Lake Valley. And just before departing, Lorenzo took another wife, Eleanor House. So with five wives and as many children, Elder Snow led his company of nearly 100 supply-laden wagons as they followed the trail marked by the Pioneer Company of 1847. Upon arrival in the Great Salt Lake Valley, the snow settled in the old fort built the year before until Lorenzo was able to build a separate cabin nearby. On February 12, 1849, Lorenzo was invited to a special meeting with the First Presidency and several members of the Twelve. Humble as he was, Lorenzo wondered why these brethren wanted to meet with him and even feared that he was to be accused of some wrongdoing. Much to his surprise, however, Lorenzo was called at this time to fill one of four vacancies in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Once again, the sacred promises of his patriarchal blessing were being fulfilled. As a new member of the Twelve, Elder Snow was called in the October General Conference of 1849 to open missionary work in Italy. Assigned as Lorenzo's companion was Joseph Toronto, whose ancestral roots were Italian. The two, in company with several other elders traveling to European missions, departed Salt Lake City shortly after the conference. As the elders made their way east, they found themselves continually guided by the hand of the Lord. Lorenzo recorded, when we arrived on the banks of the great Missouri, her waters immediately congealed for the first time during the season, thus forming a bridge over which we passed to the other side. This was no sooner accomplished than the torrent ran as before. Continuing across the country, Elder Snow and Toronto reached the Atlantic coast and boarded the packet ship Shannon bound for Liverpool, England. During the three and a half trying weeks at sea, Lorenzo was comforted that he would soon be with old friends made on his mission to the British Isles eight years earlier. As his ship approached the shore, however, his mind was drawn to his family in the distant Salt Lake Valley. Two babies had been born to him just prior to leaving, and he longed to be with his family. He wrote of this in a letter to Eliza. My mind reverts to the 19th of October, 1849, when in solemn silence I left what next to God and was dearest to my heart, my friends, my loving wives, and my dear little children. Six long months I've been augmenting the distance between me and those I love, but the Lord of the whole earth sent me, and in his name I resolve ever to go forward. As his faith overcame his homesickness, Elder Snow pursued his work with diligence. He spent nearly two months traveling to the cities where he had served before to counsel with the saints. While visiting the branch in Southampton, Lorenzo was inspired to call Brother T.B.H. Stenhouse to join him and Elder Toronto in opening the work in Italy. Of course, there's a little fair trepidation 
Italy wasn't a country as we now know it today. Various principalities, uh, papal states, there was um, major social unrest. There was a drought and uh, the political intrigues of the papal court and other secular entities. So he had quite a challenge. But again, his faith was that if the Lord wanted him to go to Italy, there would be a way opened up. Of course, the first confrontations in Italy were secret police, people who were worried about the intrigues between France and Savoy. So he basically hit a brick wall every time he turned. There was a general superstition of people, and this is the 19th century, people are very superstitious, the conflicts of Protestant and Catholic relations. But he found out that there was a people up in the mountains of the Italian French Alps, the Piedmont area, probably the oldest Protestant group, called Valdensians. These Valdensians worshipped in temples, they believed in baptism, they were an incredible people. They had kind of gone back from France to Italy and found themselves in the mountains to protect themselves. And Lorenzo Snow believed that these people had been prepared for the preaching of the gospel. So he turned his face towards the mountains and from the Catholic valleys to the mountains of Piedmont where the Valdensian people were located. Moving the headquarters of their effort to the mountain valley of Piedmont, Elder Snow and the others were soon joined by Elder Jabez Woodward. Unfortunately, the Valdensians were not as receptive as they had hoped until on September 6, 1850, when the missionaries had a breakthrough. A very wonderful, kind family in Torre Peleche had a son that got very sick, and uh, Lorenzo Snow thought this might be the opening. So again, characteristic for Lorenzo Snow, his humility, he prayed and gave the boy a blessing, and the boy was healed. This first miracle in uh, Torre Peleche opened up the door so that the missionaries could enter in and preach the gospel and result in phenomenal success in these villages of Valdensians. Climbing a tall mountain near Latour and standing high on a pointed rock, Elder Snow, along with Elders Stenhouse and Woodward, dedicated the land of Italy for the preaching of the gospel in the last days. With the land now dedicated, the missionaries began their public preaching. Elders Toronto and Woodward remained in the valleys of the Piedmont, while Elder Snow and Stenhouse traveled north into Switzerland. Lorenzo spent a month or so preaching with Elder Stenhouse in the villages of the Swiss Alps, before he determined to leave for England to oversee the translation of the Book of Mormon into Italian. Elder Snow would spend nine long months in England awaiting the Italian translation of the sacred scriptures. Finally, in January of 1852, Elder Snow could wait no longer. With nearly 100 pages still to be translated, Lorenzo took what was completed and began the journey back to his assigned field of labor. Traveling south, Lorenzo arrived in Geneva at the residence of Elder Stenhouse, who had now been joined by his wife. Spending two weeks in the region, Elder Snow was impressed not only with the stunning alpine scenery, but also with a burgeoning branch of faithful new converts. Despite difficult travel conditions, Lorenzo soon reached the Piedmont area in safety. Once again, he was pleasantly surprised to find a growing branch of the church. Excited by the success in both Italy and Switzerland, Elder Snow felt inspired to take the gospel to Malta and India. Leaving John D. Malin, a trustworthy new convert, in charge of the work in Piedmont, Elder Snow took Elder Woodward with him and departed for Malta. The missionaries traveled by steamer along the west coast of Italy, stopping at several port cities, including Naples, before arriving at the island of Malta. Elder Snow intended to stay in Malta for only a short time before traveling on to India and establishing the work there. However, a broken down steamer would prevent Lorenzo from making the journey to India before he received the call to return to Salt Lake for the April 1853 General Conference. After reassigning Elder Woodward to the Piedmont area, Elder Snow journeyed north, returning again to England. On June 12, 1852, he booked passage back to America and just under two months later arrived in the Salt Lake Valley to a joyous reunion with his family.
Lorenzo's return to Utah did not signal lazy days for the young apostle. In addition to his many apostolic duties, Elder Snow built a new home for his family and also undertook many civic responsibilities. He was appointed a regent of the University of Deseret and was elected to the legislature of the territory of Utah. It was at this point that Lorenzo Snow decided that he wanted to organize the people and do something that was very culturally driven. Again, Lorenzo Snow was well educated. He had a great grasp and love for music and poetry and readings. So Lorenzo Snow, in conjunction with his sister Eliza and others, encouraged people to come to his home and he created what he called the Polysophical Society. And this was a group that got together and sang and did readings and um, read essays and entertained each other and also educated each other. It was raising the culture of the community up a whole notch. The operations of this intellectual society occupied a significant portion of Lorenzo's time until the spring of 1853 when he was called to leave his beautiful new home and take his family north to Brigham City. Known as Box Elder at the time, Brigham City was made up of about 200 people living in log huts around a fort. Upon his arrival in May of 1855, Elder Snow recalled his initial thoughts. When I arrived in Box Elder County, I found a location where Brigham City now flourishes in a very unprosperous condition. Whether it's changed from a primitive state should be called improvement. <laughs> Whether it was better or worse for what had been done on the premises would puzzle an antiquarian. Even the big meeting house with its ground floor and earth roof was more extensively patronized as a receptacle for bedbugs than for the assemblage of saints. It was not long, however, before Lorenzo had the city surveyed and a plan was put in place for its expansion. And by the winter of 1856, Elder Snow had already created the Dramatic Association of Brigham City, which produced many stage plays starring members of the Snow family. It was here in this tiny settlement to the north that Elder Snow would become the architect of the cooperative movement, a practice that embodied many of the principles of the United Order, where the saints held all things in common. There were at least uh, 40 projects involved in a co-op system for the people in uh, Box Elder. Uh, there was a woolen factory that they organized, a millinery shop, a tailor shop, and other shops as well. He also organized guilds, uh, unions, uh, which covered uh, some of the construction industry there, uh, brick construction. There was a lime kiln, uh, carpentry, that kind of thing. And it was, it was an extensive kind of co-op system and, and became somewhat famous, even in the rest of the country. While providing for the temporal welfare of the saints under his direction, Lorenzo was often called upon to be a source of spiritual power as well. An experience typical of Elder Snow's service occurred in the winter of 1856. William Smith, an English convert who had settled in Kaysville, Utah, became very ill and his wife feared for his life. She knew Elder Snow was a great leader and dedicated apostle, but she thought it too much to ask that Elder Snow make the long and difficult journey from Brigham City in the dead of winter. As her husband's condition worsened and her prayers went up to her father in heaven, she was reminded by the spirit of a special gift that Lorenzo had been given in his patriarchal blessing. Years earlier, while spending time in the home of Sister Smith during his mission to England, Elder Snow had read his patriarchal blessing to her. She recalled being particularly impressed with the bestowal of the gift of healing upon Elder Snow and the prophecy that others would send handkerchiefs for him to bless, from which they would be healed. Prompted by this memory, Sister Smith engaged a messenger to travel the nearly impassable road and take a new silk handkerchief and a note to the home of Lorenzo. Elder Snow recorded in his journal the events that followed. I took the handkerchief and a bottle of perfumery, and on retiring to my closet, I prayed. And then I consecrated the perfumery and sprinkled it on the handkerchief. I then again bowed before the Lord 
and in earnest supplication besought him to let the healing and life-inspiring virtues of his Holy Spirit be imparted to this handkerchief, and from thence to Brother Smith, when it shall be placed upon him. When the messenger returned with the handkerchief, Sister Smith unfolded it and spread it over her dying husband's head and face. Almost immediately, William was healed. It was this kind of protection and guidance that those under the stewardship of this faithful apostle learned to rely on. In 1864, Elder Snow was called to travel with several others, including Joseph F. Smith, to the islands of Hawaii to restore order to the church there. Their mission to reform the affairs of the church was successful, but their arrival in the islands was not without incident. As they approached that beautiful harbor, uh, it was choppy and stormy, and Joseph F. Smith, who had had lots of experience in the Hawaiian Islands, just realized that, you know, I don't think this is a good time to try to go ashore. And if you're not going to command me in the name of the Lord to go, I'm just going to stay on board, and you guys can go your way. Lorenzo Snow got on the little landing craft, and as they approached the reef, it became obvious that the swells were larger than they expected, and soon the boat capsized, and Lorenzo Snow was lost sight of. Eventually, when people figured out what was going on, they found him and brought him into shore, and it seemed like his life was gone. And they tried everything that they knew to help him, but nothing worked. And then they felt inspired to breathe into him, to basically to replicate the breathing of the lungs, to breathe in and exhale. And eventually, in doing this for some time, there was a, a, a glimmer of life back. And of course, they felt like the Lord had actually preserved his life. When Lorenzo recovered, he asked about the safety of the brethren, and they, they assured him that everyone was safe and reminded him that Joseph F. Smith had stayed on board the ship. It was at that time that he prophesied that Joseph F. Smith would uh, become president of the church. Lorenzo Snow also became president of the church, uh, preceding Joseph F. Smith in that, in that office. In 1872, Lorenzo was called to join George A. Smith on a trip to Palestine to dedicate the Holy Land. After months of traveling through America and Europe, this small group of saints, consisting of Lorenzo, his sister Eliza R. Snow, George A. Smith, and four others, finally arrived in the Holy Land at the end of 1872. Elder Snow recorded his feelings during this sacred journey. We felt that we were passing over the land once occupied by the children of Abraham. The plains once trod by the kings of Israel with their marshaled hosts. The land of the apostles and prophets. Despite all the wonderful experiences the travelers had on their journey through Palestine, it was their ascension of the Mount of Olives that culminated their remarkable trip. Eliza R. Snow wrote of the events as they participated in the dedication of the land. Sunday morning, March 2nd. President Smith had a tent, table, seats, and carpet taken up on the Mount of Olives, to which all the brethren of the company and myself repaired on horseback. We united in service in the order of the Holy Priesthood, President Smith leading in humble, fervent supplication, dedicating the land of Palestine for the gathering of the Jews and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. To me, it seemed the crowning point of the whole tour, realizing as I did that we were worshiping on the summit of the mount, once the frequent resort of the Prince of Life. After traveling 25,000 miles over nine months, Elder Snow finally returned home to Brigham City and was welcomed with a reception fit for a king. The Brigham City Saints were not the only ones excited to have Elder Snow home. Since its inception, the cooperative movement under Lorenzo's direction had been a great success, and President Brigham Young was eager to duplicate that success in other settlements. To that end, Elder Lorenzo Snow was called to be a counselor in the First Presidency with the specialized duty of instructing the Saints on the workings of cooperative enterprises. However, despite the efforts of Lorenzo and many other faithful saints, the cooperative movement did not survive long without Elder Snow's active management. 
Brigham City Cooperative finally was dissolved, and the reason for that was several factors, one of which was the woolen factory burnt down by fire. The Latter-day Saints in that area wanted to rebuild it and contracted with the railroad to build a northern line. They also had to borrow money to set up a sawmill in Idaho. However, the enemies of the church uh, pressed on the government that were taking trees off of government land, and so the sawmill was stopped, which, of course, then threw them into debt and no way to pay it off. And then finally, there was a terrible drought that came in the area, and grasshoppers come in and destroyed the crops in Brigham, which uh, also hindered from making uh, the payment on debts and from rebuilding the cooperative uh, stores. Also detrimental to the cooperative movement was the passing of President Brigham Young in the summer of 1877. In a letter to Franklin D. Richards, Lorenzo described the final demise of the Brigham City cooperatives. There appeared now but one course left for us to pursue. Curtail our business, close several of our departments, lessen the business of others, and dispose of such property as will assist in the discharging of our cash obligations. The cooperatives were in debt for over $50,000, and by the following year, only the general store remained open. The year of 1879 brought another major change in the life of Lorenzo Snow, and in the lives of all the brethren who had been asked to live the law of polygamy. In 1879, the United States Supreme Court upheld the Murrill Act of 1873, which was the first of several anti-polygamy laws. Then in 1882, Congress passed the Edmonds Act, which made polygamy punishable by fine and imprisonment, and those who lived in polygamy were barred from jury service, public office, voting. In effect, this was almost the beginning of the end. And then John Taylor directed the leading brethren to go into hiding in order to escape being imprisoned. And so in what became known in LDS history as the underground, the First Presidency and some of the apostles spread out. Some went to Hawaii, some to Arizona, some to southern Utah, some to England. Elder Snow spent time living incognito in northern California. Lorenzo Snow, now nearly 70 years old and an apostle of the Lord, was forced to live on the run going from hideout to hideout and being denied the companionship of his wives and friends. As difficult as these times were for Lorenzo, they were equally trying for his struggling family. Elder Snow recorded in his journal his praise and admiration for his nine wives. My wives all acted in concert, mutually assisting each other. And with all the inconveniences, hard work, and privations to which, while raising our children, they have experienced through my frequent and at times long absences. And never have they, at any time, sought to detain me or prevent my fulfillment of public duties. These difficult times for Lorenzo and his family would become even more trying when on a secret visit to his home in Brigham City, the Snow family was visited by a number of unwelcome guests. On November 17, 1885, seven U.S. Marshals who had stolen into town under cover of darkness arrived at Lorenzo Snow's door. Aware of their evil designs, Elder Snow made use of the trap door installed in the floor of the master bedroom and hid below in a tiny room furnished with only a makeshift bed and a chair. Air was brought into the room through a small ventilation grate in the home's foundation. After searching every room, closet, cellar, and the attic space, the disappointed marshals gave up and went outside. As they were preparing to leave, however, they noticed Lorenzo's watchdog, Nero, sniffing at the small ventilation grate cut into the foundation. Returning to the master bedroom, the marshals found the trap door and arrested the 71-year-old apostle, who willingly submitted to his captors. Lorenzo Snow was charged with uh, three counts of unlawful cohabitation. Often a uh, well-known uh, polygamist, when he was tried, the, the trial was uh, really a, a sham. 
Everybody knew the facts, and they didn't have to uh, enter a lot of evidence. Reportedly, Lorenzo Snow was convicted on one piece of evidence alone, and that was that he was seen walking with one of his plural wives down the street in Brigham City. He spent 18 months as a result as a prisoner in the Utah Territorial Penitentiary. At this time in the penitentiary, there were basically two factions, the Coabs, those were the Mormon, the patriarchs, the bishops, the state presidents, the people who paid their tithing, and literally were the good guys of the community now thrown in jail with horse thieves and murderers and rapists and all kinds of things. So you had the Coabs and these other groups, and it was not always a fun time to be together. Of course, there were those rituals of coming into jail that everybody had to experience, and then the living conditions. Of course, the bed bugs uh, during the summers and the heat and during the winters, the cold, and the jail cells were small. The food was of uh, obviously poor quality and just a really tough uh, condition. Elder Snow quickly assumed the leadership of the incarcerated brethren, conducting Sunday school classes for his fellow prisoners and also counseling and inspiring them. Shortly after the rest of the church had convened for the April conference, Lorenzo Snow gathered his congregation together and provided them a unique opportunity to offer up the sacred Hosanna shout. Elder Rudger Clausen, imprisoned with Lorenzo, spoke of the event. The foundation of the prison seemed to shake, and the shout ascended to heaven. I testify to you, it is my belief that that great shout was acceptable to the Lord and is recorded in the library of the celestial kingdom. Later that spring, Elder Snow received two visits from the newly appointed territorial governor, Caleb West. The governor presented a proposition whereby if the prisoners agreed to abandon their practice of plural marriage and cohabitation in the future, the territorial leaders would seek a pardon for them from the President of the United States. Elder Snow drafted and was the first to sign the prisoners' response to this proposal. We're united to our wives for time and all eternity by the most sacred covenants. And in many instances, numerous children have been born as a result of our union, who are endeared to us by the strongest paternal ties. So far as compliance with your proposition requires the sacrifice of honor and manhood, the repudiation of our wives and children, the violation of sacred covenants, heaven forbid that we should be guilty of such perfidy perpetual imprisonment with which we are threatened or even death itself would be preferable. While life was difficult for Lorenzo in prison, the letters he wrote to family and friends exemplified the faith and commitment required of a future prophet of God. I had made up my mind from the moment of my arrest to accept without worry whatever might be the results. Being convinced that important good would surely come of it both to myself and the great cause. While Lorenzo served his time in prison faithfully, his lawyers continued to work for his release. On February 7, 1887, the U.S. Supreme Court granted Elder Snow's petition, agreeing that the procedure under which he was sentenced was improper. After 11 months away from his family, Lorenzo walked out of the prison gates a free man. Just a few months after Elder Snow's release from prison, President John Taylor passed away while hiding out in Kaysville, Utah. Shortly thereafter, at the April 1889 General Conference, Wilfred Woodruff was sustained as President of the Church, and Elder Snow assumed the position of President of the Quorum of the Twelve. Now 75 years old, and with a lifetime of vast experience and spiritual preparation, Lorenzo transitioned smoothly into a role of prominent leadership within the Church. It was in this capacity that Elder Snow participated in important councils with President Woodruff prior to the publication of the manifesto, which ended the practice of plural marriage. 
And it was as president of the Quorum of the Twelve that Lorenzo stood at that general conference and voiced his support for the new direction of the church. The manifesto allowed the leading brethren of the church to conduct their ecclesiastical duties free from the persecution of their government enemies. It was during these later years of his life that Lorenzo was also able to fulfill another promise made to him in his patriarchal blessing. In 1891, Elder Snow's 21-year-old niece, Ella Jensen, became deathly ill with scarlet fever. She seemed to linger between life and death for several weeks, and good friends had to take turns taking care of her. One of her friends, Leo Reese, said that at 3 or 4 o'clock one morning, Ella called her and said that she wanted her hairbrush and to have her fingernails clipped because they were coming to get her at 10 o'clock the next morning. They turned out to be her dead uncle and some other messengers. Well, Leah tried to calm her, and her parents did too, who Leah had called into the room. But Ella said that she knew what she was talking about, and sure enough, about 10 o'clock that morning, while her father was holding her hand, Ella died. Well, her father immediately went to Brigham City, where his brother-in-law, Lorenzo Snow, was preaching in the tabernacle and he told the apostle what had happened. Along with his good friend, Rudger Clausen, Lorenzo arrived at the Jensen home two hours after Ella had passed away. Her body had been washed and dressed in preparation for burial. At Lorenzo's request, Rudger Clausen anointed the young girl's head with oil. Elder Clausen recorded what followed. We then laid our hands upon her head and the anointing was confirmed by President Snow, who blessed her, and among other things, used this extraordinary expression in a commanding tone of voice. Come back, Ella, come back. Your walk upon the earth is not yet completed. Come back. After the blessing, Lorenzo Snow and Elder Clausen left, and about an hour later, Ella opened her eyes. And she said, where is he? Where is Elder Lorenzo Snow? He called me back. Ella told her family of her experiences and that she really didn't want to come back. And she told her friends in the spirit world that she just was going to return for a little while to comfort her family. Well, she did return for a little while. She got married, she had eight children, and lived until she was 86 years old. In April of 1893, an event took place which many of the saints in Utah thought might not ever happen. After 40 years, the Salt Lake Temple was finally completed. As its first president, Wilford Woodruff selected none other than Lorenzo Snow. An acquaintance of Lorenzo's paid him this tribute. No more fitting appointment could possibly have been made. He has ever been interested in temple work. He is spiritually minded to a very high degree. No one living is better qualified to stand as the watchman at the door which opens between the living and the dead. It was during his time as president of the Salt Lake Temple that, at the age of 82, Lorenzo fathered his 41st and final child. Lucille Snow was born to Minnie Jensen while on a vacation to Cardston, Canada in 1896. Although Lorenzo was deeply involved with his family and in the workings of the Salt Lake Temple and the church in general, perhaps his greatest challenges still lay ahead. After many years of battling with the government and trying to sustain the economy of a new state, the church was greatly in debt. President Wilford Woodruff, shortly before his death, wrote of his concern for the financial state of the church. It seems as though we shall never live to get through with it unless the Lord opens the way in a miraculous manner. It looks as though we shall never pay our debts this burden would soon be lifted from off of President Woodruff, however, and come to rest squarely on the shoulders of Lorenzo Snow. At the age of 84, Lorenzo Snow was preparing for the end of a life given to the Lord in service. At the April conference, he spoke to the saints of his thoughts concerning the next life. As we advance in years and come nearer to what we generally consider as the time of our departure into the other life, we are more inclined to devote our thoughts upon those things that we may receive in the next life, and the proper preparations that we have made 
and our making to reach that which is anticipated. I know it is so with me. Although he might not have known it at the time, Lorenzo's work on the earth was not quite finished, and the Lord soon took the opportunity to inform his future prophet. Following the death of Wilfred Woodruff, uh, Lorenzo Snow, who was uh, obviously president of the Quorum of the Twelve, had some big decisions to make, and he needed to confer with the Lord himself. After Joseph Smith's martyrdom, Brigham Young waited three and a half years to reorganize the first presidency. Following President Young's death, John Taylor waited three years to reorganize the first presidency. After President Taylor passed away, Wilfred Woodruff waited somewhere uh, between two years and two and a half years before he reorganized the first presidency. And Lorenzo Snow was concerned about uh, how long we should wait to reorganize uh, the first presidency. He went into the Holy of Holies in the Salt Lake Temple and prayed for a long time. He was an old man, he was feeble, the answer didn't come. His son, Leroy Snow, informs us that as uh, President Snow walked dejectedly out of the Holy of Holies, Jesus Christ appeared to him and informed President Snow that the first presidency should be reorganized immediately and that he should be the president of the church. Within days of Wilford's passing, the apostles gathered together and sustained Lorenzo Snow as the new president of the church, with George Q. Cannon and Joseph F. Smith as his counselors. The Deseret News announced the call to his faithful followers. His entire life has been a school, God's school, fitting him for the exalted position he now occupies among his brethren. His long experience in the service of the church, his intimate acquaintance with the founders thereof, and above all integrity and apostolic zeal, qualify him for the position he has been called to occupy as the fifth president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. However, President Snow expressed humility to his brethren when he stated, I do not want this administration to be known as Lorenzo Snow's administration, but as God's, in and through Lorenzo Snow. As president, Lorenzo quickly turned his attention to finding a solution to the church's problem of increasing debt. The church issued bonds and abandoned several unprofitable mining, milling, and railroad ventures. But the prophet knew these were only temporary fixes. In the spring of 1899, Lorenzo was instructed by the Lord to travel to St. George and hold a special conference with the saints there. He did not know what he was to tell the gathering body, but he obeyed the Spirit and set out for Utah's Dixie. At the time of the prophet's visit, the region was suffering through a devastating drought. Nephi Savage described the conditions. Eighteen months prior to the coming of President Lorenzo Snow and his party, there had not been enough moisture fall at any one time to lay the dust in the streets. As a result, many of the streams and wells of the country had dried up, and starvation seemed to face the people. The concerned saints attended the various sessions of the conference, hoping their prophet would provide the answer to their problems. Ever following the promptings of the Spirit, Lorenzo spoke on many different gospel principles. His son, Leroy Snow, who was acting as the clerk of the conference, recorded the account of the prophet's most famous talk, which would eventually restore the region and the church as a whole to a healthier state. I was sitting at a table reporting the proceedings when all at once, father paused in his discourse. Complete stillness filled the room. When he commenced to speak again, his voice strengthened and the inspiration of God seemed suddenly to come over him. Then, he revealed to the Latter-day Saints the vision that was before him. He told them that he could see, as he had never realized before, how the law of tithing had been neglected by the people. Also, that the saints themselves were heavily in debt, as well as the church. And now, through strict obedience to this law, the paying of a full and honest tithing, 
Not only would the church be relieved of its great indebtedness, but this would also be the means of freeing the Latter-day Saints from their individual obligations, and they would become a prosperous people. Determined to put the saints on the proper path, Lorenzo stopped at nearly every Mormon settlement between St. George and Salt Lake City to remind them of their obligations to the Lord and the blessings that would come from paying their tithing. After repeating his talk on tithing to congregations throughout Utah and Idaho over the next year, President Snow was able to report that payments to the church had doubled and that the rains were returning to southern Utah. And though it would not be completely free of debt until after his death, the church was put on sound financial ground thanks to Lorenzo's direction. In fact, the future prophet Heber J. Grant had this to say about President Snow's impact on the church. I know that Lorenzo Snow was a prophet of God. He lifted the church from the financial slew of despond, from almost financial bankruptcy. And in three years, this man, beyond the age of ability and the estimation of the world, took hold of the finances of the Church of Christ, and in those three years changed everything financially from darkness to light. During this same time, President Snow again assumed control of the Deseret News, which for the last seven years had been leased to George Q. Cannon and Sons calling Charles W. Penrose, a future apostle, as editor. Lorenzo made it clear that this newspaper would serve as the official media voice for the church as it entered the 20th century. After restoring temporal stability to the church, President Snow next turned his attentions to refocusing the other general authorities on their roles as witnesses of the Savior and missionaries for the gospel. He stated, their business is to warn the nations of the earth and prepare the world for the coming of the Savior. Now we find ourselves in a compact, gathered condition. It looks to me that our minds ought to extend somewhat when we get out of the beaten track. It is for the apostles to show to the Lord that they are his witnesses to all the nations and that they are doing the best they can. Having strengthened the church financially and redirected the apostles' efforts, the aging Lorenzo continued to preach the basics of the gospel to the saints up until the October Conference of 1901. Concerned over a heavy chest cold, the prophet's doctors and family persuaded him to miss most of the sessions of the conference. Ever mindful of his followers, however, Lorenzo Snow summoned the strength to speak at the final session, but for his devotion, he would pay the ultimate price. Weakened by the vigors of making himself heard by the vast audience without the aid of modern microphones, Lorenzo returned to his bed and spent the following night retching and vomiting. His wife Minnie attended to his every need, and Joseph F. Smith administered a priesthood blessing. But still, the prophet's condition worsened, slipping in and out of consciousness. On October 10th, 1901, four days after his final conference address, Lorenzo Snow passed away peacefully at the age of 87. Speaking at President Snow's funeral, Brigham Young Jr. fondly expressed his love for the man he called his second father. About two hours before his death, I laid my hand upon his brow and said, President Snow, do you recognize me? He looked at me with his sweet smile and eyes full of intelligence and said, I rather think I do. He knew his time had come. God had willed it. I have known President Snow since before the death of the Prophet Joseph Smith. And no man that has lived among us has been more thorough, more diligent, wiser in all positions where he has been placed and shown more integrity to the work than the late President Snow. Although his patriarchal blessing foreshadowed the life of a great and influential Latter-day Saint, it was left to Lorenzo Snow himself to take the gifts and opportunities presented him and live the life of a chosen prophet of God. Lorenzo had allowed the Spirit to guide his life, 
and for that the Lord rewarded him with a loving family, devoted followers, and without question, a place in the mansions of his father.